Even if it's live, it's still going to be straight. And it got wound last. It got wound Wednesday night when Joe Warner was um, preaching. I noticed him when we were worshiping, and um, it's got to be straight to get the peace behind it. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. I just want to say, um, you know, we're, we're calling this a soft open these last couple of weeks. Um, we've kind of streamlined our, our worship service just a little bit. And I know some of you out there might be glad that the worship service is not lasting as long as it normally does. Um, I want it to be as long as we've always done it, and it, and it will be. But um, I just want to thank, say thank you to the mothers and the fathers who are bringing their children in here. And I know it's not the best circumstance, but um, I appreciate y'all plowing through with that, and we're hoping by the first week when we meet in June that we'll be able to resume everything downstairs with Children's Church, Nursery, and Three, Fours, and Fives, and all, so we'll be making some announcements about that, but I just wanted to tell the parents, thank y'all for, um, for, for being faithful and still coming, even, even with your children, and you know, if you think about the church, and the early church, they never had um, Children's Church, and they just gathered together, and if they had kids or whoever it was, they all came together and met in one place. So really, this is probably a, a resemblance of what the early church looked like, probably in the book of Acts. But um, I want to read something here. My son Lee um, sent me this, and I hadn't, I hadn't seen this. I'm surprised I missed it. But um, uh, the president made, a, uh, made an announcement uh, this past Friday. And I just want to read some, I, got, I pulled up the news article from it, I just want to read some of the excerpts from this. Some of you may have already may have already seen this or heard this, but I thought it was appropriate for me to read this. And uh, it says, President Donald Trump on Friday commanded America's governors to immediately reopen churches and other places of worship shuttered by the coronavirus pandemic, threatening to override the state leaders if they refused to follow his directive. Speaking at a previously unannounced news briefing at the White House, the President revealed that officials at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention were issuing guidance for communities of faith and declared houses of worship, churches, synagogues, and mosques to be essential places that provide essential services. Some governors have deemed liquor stores and abortion clinics as essential but have left out churches and other houses of worship. Trump told, support, Trump told reporters, it's not right. So I'm correcting this injustice and calling houses of worship essential. Trump said the governors need to do the right thing and allow these very important essential places of faith to open right now for this weekend. If they don't do it, I will override the governors. In America, we need more prayer, not less. Yeah. Amen. So I, I thought that was good. And I, I just want to say as your pastor, I believe the church as an ally in the White House. Yeah. I, I, I truly believe that. And you can say what you want about your politics, but as a Christian, I believe the church has an ally in the White House. So praise God. Um, and you know, last week I said that, if y'all were here last week for my message, I, I asked y'all before. I didn't, even, I didn't even say it. I asked y'all... The question I said, are, are churches essential? And all of you, most of everyone in here, uh, with a resounding yes, you, you shouted out, yes, they are. So I believe that he was, that he had a conference call, they said, with some pastors, and, and I believe that he's really listening and hearing from pastors and from churches and from the will of the of the American Christian people and what they what what, what the uh, church wants to do. So, but this event, I believe, has caused the church to get more serious about who we are and what our mission is. I've said this more than once, when we meet, this is not a religious gathering. It's not a, it's not a religious experience. You know, as a, as, a, as a person, you cannot put church on your checklist and say, this is just, this is just another thing in my life that I do. I, you know, I go to work, I, I do all these different things during the week, and on Sundays, I go to church. So I just check the box. No, this isn't a religious gathering. What you and I are doing here is, is literally life and death. Christianity is about life and death. And the Bible says it's not just physical death, it's eternal death and eternal life. So this is very serious. It's very real when we, when we gather here. It's not, again, just a, just a religious gathering that we, that we do every week. 
Last week's message I shared the things the Lord has been showing me, and I titled the message last week a wake-up call. And I believe the Lord is purging his church. He, he, he's always in a process, I believe, of, of cleansing and purging his church. And the Bible talks about a separation. Jesus talked about a separation that was going to happen where the Lord was going to separate the goats from the sheep and the wheat from the weeds. That God is always bringing a sifting and a separation to his church. And if you were here with us Wednesday night, uh, Brother Joe Warner and, and Brother Jerry Cochran were here with us. We had a tremendous service, just a great time in the Lord with those two men here Wednesday night. But Joe Warner said something, and I, I, I agree with him. He said, the time is over for make-believe Christians. But it's just time for us to quit playing church and, and to really be the church that God has called us to be. So the Lord... Um, has been reminding me that though we are in this world, we are not of this world. The Bible says we are in the world, and believers. And just what Christine was talking about, we are the light of the world. And I, and I thought when you said Christine was so appropriate, that word that you that you gave, it's true. If we stay, if we stay hidden in the darkness, how was the darkness ever going to see the light? we we got to come out and be the light. But the Bible says as Christians, we are in the world. Why? Because we have no other place to live. There's no other place for us to, to live. This is the place where we live. But even though we are in the world, we are not of the world. And, and what does that mean? That means we are not like the world. We don't go and act and do and speak the way the world does. And uh, if you look at the world and you listen to what the world says, the world likes to place people in many different categories. Religion, race, gender, conservative, liberal, progressive rich and poor. But if you read the Bible, the Bible really only reveals two categories. In Malachi chapter 3, it says, On the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty, they will be my treasured possession. I will spare them just as a father has compassion and spares his son who serves him. And you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who don't. The Bible says that God makes a distinction. There's a distinction between the people of God, the people who love the Lord, who serve the Lord, who have surrendered to God, and the people who have not. There is a difference. But what, what makes this distinction? What makes the difference? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ makes the difference. Either you are in Christ or you're not. The Bible says that our salvation is not by works. In other words, it has nothing to do with man. God made our salvation in such a way that man could not play a part. It's 100% by grace, the Bible says, that you are saved through faith. The other thing that this pandemic has exposed is the instability of the world systems in which we live. Institutions that once seemed stable, stable became weak. The stock market in a matter of days lost trillions of dollars. The oil market sank. Governments and world economies closed. Jobs that once seemed prosperous and secure were gone in an instant. Just in an instant, all of those things that, that, that the world places their confidence in and places their trust in, in an instant, in a moment's time, all of those things were removed. But the Bible tells us that, tells us that there is a place that cannot be moved. It's called the kingdom of God. And that's my message today is an unshakable kingdom, an unshakable kingdom. It's imperative for you and I as believers to understand our position in Christ. As believers, we do not need to search for a place that is firm or work, that is a firm or, or, or worldly system that will make us secure. We are already now living in that place. We need to understand our position and our place as believers. It's imperative for you and I to understand this. And my hope is that when we have a deeper understanding of this kingdom, it will increase our faith and our confidence in who we are, and by doing so will cause us to walk in fear, to walk in faith and not in fear. Amen. The New Testament gives us numerous accounts of the kingdom of God. There's numerous times that it's mentioned. Jesus, when speaking and teaching, often mentioned the kingdom of God. But I believe when you and I say the kingdom of God, it's one of those things that maybe you've read or maybe you've spoken, 
but it's difficult for you to put a definition or, the, or an explanation on what it really is. What is what is the kingdom of God? Now, before we put this up on the screen, I want to read this first. Um, broadly speaking, the kingdom of God is the rule of an eternal sovereign God over all the universe. Several passages of Scripture show that God is the undeniable monarch of all creation. In Psalms 103, it says, The Lord has established His throne in heaven, and His kingdom rules over all. In Daniel chapter 4, it says, And as King Nebuchadnezzar declared, His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. Every authority that exists has been established by God. That's in Romans 13. So in one sense, the kingdom of God incorporates everything that is. God is sovereign. God is in control of everything. God, God, God is in control of everything. But look at this. Put, put this up on the screen, please. This, I believe, really speaks more specifically to what, what it is that I'm trying to say to you today. More narrowly, the kingdom of God is a spiritual rule over the hearts and lives of those who willingly submit to God's authority. Those who, those who defy God's authority and refuse to submit to Him are not part of the kingdom of God. In contrast, those who acknowledge the lordship of Christ and gladly surrender to God's rule in their hearts are part of the kingdom of God. In this sense, the kingdom of God is spiritual. Jesus said His kingdom was not of this world, and He preached that repentance is necessary to be a part of the kingdom of God. I doubt very seriously that most Christians wake up every day and tell themselves, I'm living in the kingdom of God. But I'm here to tell you as a Christian, if you are a believer in this room or listening to this today, you are living in the kingdom of God. Right now, that is your place and that is your position. So that's extremely important for you and I to understand and know that. I'm going to go to a passage in Hebrews chapter 12 that I believe explains what this kingdom is. In Hebrews chapter 12 it says, See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warned us from heaven? At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised once more I will shake not only the earth but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Yes. That's an amazing scripture. If you've studied or ever read the book of Hebrews, it's one of my favorite books in the Bible. It's an, it's an incredible book. And it, it, it does a tremendous job of grabbing, grabbing scriptures and passages from the, from the Old Testament and given, given the connection of the, of the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. It's just a tremendous, tremendous book, a wealth of knowledge. But if you've ever studied or read the book of Hebrews, you will discover that it gives us several warnings. There's several warnings in the book of Hebrews. The first warning that it gives in Hebrews chapter 2 is a warning to pay attention. It says it's a, it's, a, it's a warning to pay attention to the message of salvation, which in Hebrews it says, How shall we escape if we ignore, if we ignore or neglect so great a salvation? In other words, the Hebrew writer is, is warning us, how are you going to escape the pending judgment of God, the, the pending judgment for your sin? How are you going to escape that judgment if you neglect the great salvation that God has made available to you through His Son, Jesus Christ? That's a warning that He gives us, a warning to pay attention. The second warning that it gives us is a warning against unbelief. In, in Hebrews chapter 3, it's an unbelief against a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. Then the third warning that Hebrews gives us is a warning against falling away in chapter 6. Falling away, the Bible calls this, this is called a spirit of apostasy. It's a spirit of, 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 of people not, of, of, of apathy and complacency where there's no longer any urgency or desire for anybody to want to, want to know God or be with God. It's, it, it's, it's taking the things of God for granted. And apostasy can even occur even within the church. 
even within the people of God that once loved God and once served God and once said they honored God, all of a sudden, for whatever reason, that person has fallen away from God. The Bible says that the spirit of apostasy will be, will be increasing when, during, during the last days before the return of Christ. I believe we are in the last days right now. Amen. And that spirit is prevalent all across the world today. There is a spirit of falling away. There's a, there's a, there's a lack of urgency and a sense of need for, for God and a, that, 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 once, that once happened in the church, a passion for the things of God. And then the, the Hebrews... The Hebrew book gives us a warning against refusing the Lord, which is here in chapter 12 in our text today. But in Hebrews chapter 1, and I'll have this on the screen, it tells us in the past, God spoke through our forefathers and prophets, but in, his, but in these last days, He is speaking to us by His Son. In other words, see, the, the, the Hebrew writer was bringing the Old Testament into the New Testament with Christ, and he's telling us that in the past, God spoke through men. Basically, that's what, that's what he was saying. It's God spoke through men. He spoke through forefathers. Moses in these last days, in these last days, God is speaking to us through his son. In other words, God is not speaking through a man. God is speaking directly to us through his son, Jesus Christ. There's a big difference when God speaks through a man and God speaks to us directly himself. And that's the warning that it gives us is a warning against refusing against refusing the Lord. And in this passage that we read here, it says, if they were punished for not listening to men, in other words, if God punished the nation of Israel, and they were punished, if you read the Old Testament, they were severely punished. They walked away from God. They, they forgot who the Lord was. They, they disobeyed God. They did all the things that God told them not to do. But the Bible says if they were punished for not listening when, when, when a man spoke to them, how much more will we be punished for not listening when God Himself is speaking to us? Do you see? You see what He's saying? And that's a that's a warning from us. God, God is now see. God is now speaking directly from heaven to us. There's no filter. There's no there's no filter anymore. The words from Christ are coming directly from the throne room of heaven. God is speaking directly to us through His Son Jesus Christ. That's how God speaks to us now. So. But in this passage in Hebrews, I want to just break this down this morning. And I believe that, that really the, this passage in Hebrews gives us three things that the message of the gospel will produce. It's going to produce a removing, a remaining, and a receiving. So in, in, in Hebrews 12, 27, it says the words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things. So the first thing I want to look at is the removing of what can be shaken. See, the message of the gospel spoken through Jesus Christ is shaking every foundation and institution that we live in right now. I believe we are experiencing this all across the earth. God is exposing the weaknesses of the worldly systems man has created. He is exposing the foolishness of those who place their hope and trust in such fragile and unpredictable systems. See, God, God is, the Bible says that, that God is shaking. There, there's a shaking that's taking place. But see, remember when this book of Hebrews is written to the church, it's written to the believers. See, in the world without Christ, they will not and cannot understand what the Hebrew writer is saying. But we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. We have the voice of truth revealing to us what the Word of God says. And God is in the process of removing and shaking things. And we as the church better not have our trust and our hope in those things. So what is God shaking right now? What is God removing? Well, God's shaking the governments and the powers of men. See, men have placed their, 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 their hope and their confidence in militaries and wealth and, 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 and institutions and all of these things that they, that they have built, that they have made. That's what they are putting their, their confidence in. But God is shaking those things. And they, they will be removed. None will be left standing. All the things that man has created, the Bible says there is a shaking. There is a shaking that's taking place. And there is a day that's coming when those things will no longer, those, no, those things will no longer be standing. God is also shaking financial institutions, the banking systems, investments, treasury, bonds, stocks, all the created money systems 
will be removed. So I'm just here to tell you, remember, God is speaking to the church. And God is speaking to Christians. And we have to be careful that we don't side with the world and place our hope and our trust in the same things that the world places their hope in. I'm not saying it's wrong to invest. I'm not saying it's wrong to save money. I'm not saying it's wrong to do all of those things. But your confidence, your hope can never be in those things. Amen. You can never say that, that, that my life is dependent on what my 401k does. Or my life is dependent on what the stock market does every day. That's not your hope. That's not your trust. If all of those things were removed in an instant, we would still be living in the kingdom of God. Amen. See, but there's a shaking taking place. So it's a warning that God has given us for the church. Don't place your hope in those things that the Bible says God's shaking those things. Why? Because those things will be removed. There's a time coming when those things, those things will be removed. So, again, I'm not saying it's wrong to invest. I believe God rewards investment. God, God rewards prudence and diligence and wisdom and money. But you can't live for your money. You can't live for your comp in, with your confidence placed in banks and systems and, and, and savings accounts and all of those things. That's not your trust. Those things can be gone in an instant. Those are man things. The, the, the wealth of the world and the monies of the world are manly things. That's not God. So that's not our trust. And then God is shaking religious institutions and traditions. The studies that I did and several different studies I did on this passage of Hebrews indicates when, it, when it's talking about the, the shaking that was taking place, um, was pointing to the removal of the civil and ecclesiastical state of the Jewish nation. The old order and traditions of religion is being shaken and removed. In other words, God, God is doing the shaking of the old order of things, and he's, he's, he's placing up, he's setting up a new kingdom. He's putting in place, he's putting in place a new kingdom. But there's a removing of things that can be shaken. The, 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 the believer, we cannot be moved by the shakings of the world. In other words, I, I can't be on edge. That's why I said this. And I've been saying this throughout this whole pandemic. And Christine had a word for us. The last service that we met, the, the last time we met before the churches were, were, were closed down for the pandemic, Christine had a word from the Lord that we were, that we were experiencing what she called Braxton Hicks. And I'm not a woman, but, but I understand that Braxton Hicks is, is the pre- is the pre-birth pains to the birth pains. It was just like God, it's like God's preparing the woman for birth, like what's about to come. And it was an appropriate word that she gave, that God is preparing his church. That, 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 that in other words, God, that, there's a little bit of shaking, but we're still standing. Yes. See, you can't be moved by the things of the world. And what she said was appropriate. There's going to be greater shakings that's going to come. If, yes. if, if, we, if we remain longer and the Lord tarries, there's going to be even greater shakings. Are you going to stand? God, 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 God's shaking all of these things, and God, see, God's sifting. God's always sifting. God's always purging. Why? He wants to know who are truly His. Where's the remnant? Where's the ones that truly say, God, I'm with you. I love you. I serve you. You're all I, you're all I need. That's what God is doing. Then look what He says in verse 27. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. So the next thing is the remaining of what cannot be shaken. See, what, what cannot be shaken? This is what we need to listen to as Christians. All created things will be removed. But the gospel system was not instituted by man. See, God set up the gospel in such a way, man's hands had nothing to do with it. Man, man, man had no part of the gospel. And all you have to do is go back to the New Testament and read the Gospels. And I've said this to this church before, and it's important for you to understand this. The birth of Christ was a virgin birth, right? Why was that so significant? Because had had the birth been a had, had the birth not been a virgin birth, it would have been of who? It would have been a man, which would have been of Adam. And the Bible says everyone born of Adam has what? Has sinned. God made it in such a way that when Jesus Christ was born in the earth, Man had absolutely nothing to do with it at all. It was a virgin birth. The Bible says Mary was conceived by the Holy Ghost. Man, man's hands didn't touch this. Man, man had nothing to do with it. So, so the gospel, the message of the gospel, the, the salvation of, of lost people, the salvation of the sinner, the mercy and grace that God has ushered in when Jesus Christ stepped foot in the earth, that, that gospel is not a created thing. It's the thing 
that is only by God. See, it was designed in such a way that man could not bring it or destroy it. It is the only thing that cannot be shaken. Do you understand that? The kingdom of God, the message of the gospel, the salvation that, that we receive when we confess Jesus Christ, that's the only thing that cannot be removed. That's the only thing that cannot be shaken. Listen to this, to this commentary that I came across that I thought was very appropriate for this. It is by the gospel from heaven that God shook the pieces of the civil and ecclesiastical state of the Jewish nation and introduced a new state of the church that cannot be removed, shall never be changed for any other on earth, but shall remain till it be made perfect in heaven. God has instant see, what did Jesus say? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, where? On earth as it is in heaven. See, there was a transfer. When Christ came to the earth, Christ brought the kingdom of God from heaven down to earth. God is establishing his kingdom here on earth. But where is his kingdom being established? In you and me. The kingdom of God is us, is those of us who have confessed Christ. It's not, the kingdom is not a, it's not a physical place. It's not, it's not worldly systems, it's not, it's not governments, it's not buildings. The kingdom of God is those of us who have received and accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ. The salvation of God. We are the body of Christ. We are the kingdom of God residing on the earth now. Do you understand that? And the Bible says, when all the other shakings take place and everything will be shaken and everything will be removed that's created, all created things will be removed. But the gospel wasn't created it was given to us by God. That's the only thing that will remain. Amen. Aren't you glad? Yes. Aren't you glad? See, what do we have to be afraid of? Where's the fear? The church should not be walking in fear. We should be walking in boldness and faith. Yes. That this is what God has given us. <clears throat> this is what the Word of God says. See, this kingdom can never be shaken or removed. This is the kingdom we live in if we are in Christ. Remember what Jesus told Nicodemus. Remember the religious leader that came to Jesus in John chapter 3. Jesus said, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. In other words, Jesus was giving Nicodemus the way to get, to get, Nicodemus wanted to be part of this kingdom. God, what do I do? How do I, you need to be born again. Well, born again, see, that's one of those phrases everybody freaks out with in the world, like, oh my gosh, born again, what are you talking about? Well, if you, if you look at the definition and understanding of what it means to be baptized and what it means to be saved, that is the born again experience. When you are born and baptized, you die. That, that, that's, that's, a, that's a symbol of death. The, 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 the baptism of take symbolizes death. You go underneath the water and you are, you, you are, you are dead to yourself, the Bible says, the old David died. That, that's a death. But then I'm, ra I'm raised to walk in units of life, the Bible says. I'm what? I'm born again. Yes. See, I'm new now. It's just a symbol. It's the, bap the, the water baptism doesn't save you, but it symbolizes what you've done, what, what you've confessed with your mouth. It's a physical representation of what you've done, what, what you've spoken with your mouth, what you've declared. That's what born again is. That's how we enter the kingdom of God. So praise God. We are in the kingdom that can never be shaken or removed. Rejoice again, I said. Rejoice, the Bible said. We should be excited. See, you should wake up every day and remind yourself, guess what? I'm living in the kingdom of God. Amen. See, but it's difficult for you to get that because it, the kingdom's not a physical place. It's not a city. Like I drive from Cummins and I'm going to go to Baton Rouge and all of a sudden when I'm in Baton Rouge, I'm in the kingdom of God. No, it doesn't work that way. I'm in the kingdom of God now. Amen. That's your position. That's your place. Do you understand this? This is why it's so important for us to read the Bible. Re read the Bible. That, that's how you build your faith. You read the Bible. The Bible reinforces your faith. Aha! Uh -huh. All of these things that I believe in, they're real. They, they really matter. They have, they, have, they have real meaning to me. You're living in a kingdom, the Bible says. And, and, and Hebrews tells us everything else will be shaken. All the created things in the world, they will be shaken. And then they, re they will be removed. But one thing remains. The church. God's people, your salvation. But see, that takes faith. That takes faith. Like, you go tell that to somebody who's not a Christian, they, they, lobble, they, they, might, they might just punch you right into the face. Like, you must have some kind of nutcase. Yeah, I'm a nutcase. I believe what the Bible says. I'm born again. 
I'm living in God's kingdom. I, I've received the truth. I, I, I'm living in a, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the light. I, I received the truth of this. I understand the truth of what this world's all about. I'm not the nut, you're the nut. I believe the truth. That's what the Bible says. Then in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 28 and 29, it says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. The next thing we need to see is we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And in verse 28 there, it says, Therefore, so always look in Scripture to see what the therefores are there for. Y'all do know that. That's one, of the, that's one of the tricks to study. It really is. When you read Scripture, you, when you see a therefore, find out what it's there for. And when you see what it's there for, go back and find out what it's there for. And it makes sense to you. That's a lot of therefores. <laughs> but obviously what is the Hebrew writer saying is it's therefore. It's therefore what? Since all of these things that are going to be shaken, all of these things that, these created things, these man, all these things are going to be removed for what's going to remain. Christianity, the gospel, the church, the, the salvation, the Bible says. Since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, what, what should our response be? Well, we should be thankful. You should be thankful. Even when things in your life ain't going right, you should, you should thank God. Because there's nothing that can happen in your life that can take away what God has given you. Even death. God is set up in such a way that even when we die, even when we die, the kingdom still remains. Why? Because it's not physical, it's spiritual. See, it's a spiritual kingdom. So, so even if they take our bodies, even if our, this physical body will die, we're all going to die. People are afraid of dying. We're going to die. I know it sounds morbid to say that, but people die. We die, but in Christ, the Bible says we live. Even though we die, we live. Amen. Aren't you glad? We should be so excited. The church should be so excited. What do you have to be depressed about? What are you downtrodden about? What are you afraid of? What, what, what is it? What can come against us, the Bible says? Nothing. Not even death itself, the Bible says. And then what, is, what does it say? Our response should be worship. Worship God with, in all the, 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 the Hebrew says, with pure hearts and devotion. We need to just come before God with, with pure devotion and just worship God for who He is. And thank God for what He's done for us. See, we're talking about the kingdom of God and everything that God has done. And isn't it great? Yeah. It is. Yeah. But guess what? You don't deserve it. <laughs> and neither do I. Do you understand? That's what grace is. Yeah. It is for by grace. It is for by grace you are saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. Grace is something that you get that you don't deserve. We don't, we, we, we look, see, that's why when people spit in the face of the cross and say, well, I don't want Jesus. I don't want this God stuff. I don't want this Bible stuff. Don't you understand that God has given you something you didn't deserve? And you're going to tell him, no, thank you? So all these things that we're celebrating here, we have to remind ourselves of this. We don't deserve them. But God, in his mercy and his grace, he lavished them. The Bible says he, he lavished these things upon us. Why? Because he loved us. The Bible says he loved us. And then the Hebrews there, it says, we need to just offer God our complete surrender. Like, God, what, what can I give? I can't, I can't earn my salvation. I can't, I can't buy my salvation. But God, what can, I, what can I do? I can offer myself as a, as a living sacrifice. I can offer myself as a vessel. I can surrender myself to God and say, God, here I am. I'm yours. Look at this last thing I want to read here that, that I believe explains this last couple of verses here in Hebrews. It says that as if the writer to the Hebrews said, there is, a, there is a choice before you. Remain unshakably true to God, and in the day when the universe is shaken into destruction, your relationship with God will stand safe and secure. Be false to God, and that very God who might have been your salvation will be to you a consuming fire of destruction. It is a grim thought, but in it there is the eternal truth which there is no altering, that if a man is true to God, he gains everything, and if he is untrue to God, he loses everything. In time and in eternity, nothing matters save only loyalty 
to God. See, God is a consuming fire. God is, God, is, God is a God of grace and mercy, but the Bible also tells us that God is just. And when you say that God is just, God cannot leave sin unpunished. Sin will be punished. But the Bible says that God has made a way for us to, to, to be exempt, to be removed from the punishment. It's called the blood of Christ. It's called the, it's called the cross. It's called the, the salvation of Jesus Christ. That's what God has done for us. So we who are in Christ are living in an unshakable kingdom. Let the church be glad and rejoice. Praise God, we cannot be shaken or removed. We too with Christ remain forever. Aren't you excited? That, that should get us excited. See, we, we live in this world. We, we can't help it. We, we, we are around the unbelievable. We are around the depressed. We are around the negative. We are around the pessimism and all the, all the fears and all the things in the world. We, we are surrounded by that. But if we would just shut that down for just a moment, just close it off for just a second and go and open up what the Bible says. What does God say? I'm living in a kingdom that, was not, that man's hands didn't touch. That man had nothing to do with it. So when all the created things are removed, the kingdom I'm living in is going to stand forever. Amen. Amen. Isn't that awesome? Amen. Uh, you can stand to your feet, please. Um, uh, it's after 11. What happened? <laughs> Woo! Oh, no. I, I,